I am Frank Spotnitz. I am a writer and producer and the CEO of Big Light Productions in London and Paris. I think like most people, the pandemic has been a very strange experience for me. Um, my normal week, I'm shuttling between London and Paris, and I've done that for the past five years. And all of that has come to a screeching halt since mid-March. And so I've been basically locked in this very room for um, all these months, um, staring at a screen like I am right now, talking to people. Um, it's been extraordinarily productive, actually. We've gotten an awful lot of done. I don't a lot awful lot done. I don't think we've slowed down one bit during this time. Um, but again, like so many other people, I miss social interaction. I miss seeing people. I miss going out. And I am beginning to get a little tired of this room and a little tired of staring at this screen. It's interesting because um, I have thought about ideas that are directly related to the pandemic. And there are some of those ideas that may be worth doing, but I suspect that most of them aren't and that most of the stories people are going to tell uh, that spring from this period are not directly related to the fact that we've had to stop ordinary life for a period of time. I think we're in such an extraordinary moment of social and political and cultural and economic change um, that really our task as storytellers is to make sense of all of that. Um, and we're in the midst of it. So it's very hard as a dramatist to reach any conclusions um, about what's happening. But you can't help feeling these very strong currents that are running through the entire world and this instability um, that doesn't feel like it's going to go away anytime soon. And in some ways, the pandemic and the fact that people have been desocialized and um, had more time, honestly, has accelerated a lot of the, the cultural and political change. Um, this has also been obviously hugely destabilizing to uh, what we do, to the production of dramas and to theater. I mean, it's been absolutely devastating. And I do think when the pandemic ends, and you know, fingers crossed it will end in the next uh, 12 months or less, um, there's gonna be extraordinary rebirth. Um, and I'm, I'm very, uh, very excited and eager to see what that looks like. The high points for me about the pandemic have been all related to having more time. So because I haven't been traveling all the time, I've had more time with my family. I've had more time to sleep. I've had more time to read. I've gone back and watched literally 75 movies uh, with my, my children. Um, and so it's been sort of a, a recharging period for me, which has been great. And I didn't realize how much I needed it actually. Um, and I do think, you know, some things will be different when life returns to normal, uh, if such a thing is possible. I mean, as I said, I, I am used to traveling back and forth to London every week at a minimum, going back and forth between London and Paris with many other trips to uh, Rome and to Berlin and to Toronto and Los Angeles and New York. And, you know, you look at that now and think, was that really necessary? I mean, there's an awful lot of that travel you don't need to do. So I, I expect there will be less business travel going forward uh, and we'll be more selective uh, about that and probably more efficient, and probably better for the planet. Uh, it's gonna hurt some people economically. Uh, it's a mixed bag, but um, I, I think that's gonna be the biggest change is I think there's gonna be a mix of in-person and virtual uh, meetings that will be probably more humane uh, in the long run. I have come up with so many new ideas during lockdown. I can't share them because I hope to do them um, and 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 you know market them. But um, yeah, it's been an incredibly fertile period. And and actually going back and and reading, like having time to read, which I rarely did um, for pleasure and watching so many of my favorite movies has been hugely inspiring to me. 
one of the ideas is actually an old idea that I tried to do 20 years ago and didn't get off the ground. And I've, I've been revisiting that. But otherwise, they're all like new ideas. And I do find myself thinking a lot about the 1960s, because that was a period also of huge change, rapid change. And I thought about how difficult it was for filmmakers, more so than television makers, to capture that moment. I don't think television was trying to be as relevant as uh, film was trying to be in that era. And I do think you're going to see a lot of dramas that are about the present moment, but not set in the present moment. Because it's changing so quickly, I think there's a fear that your show will be out of date by the time it, it reaches uh, airwaves. So I think you'll find ways to talk about what we're going through, but set in another time or place. I think because we're still in the midst of it and still processing it, for a storyteller, it's very awkward to, to come into this, unless you're going to you know, pick a very personal angle on this. It's, it's hard to say bigger things about it because we don't know yet. Um, so I think you're going to see stories that are, that are smaller or that are uh, set in other times and places. It's my anecdotal uh, observation that broadcasters have rushed toward commissioning non-scripted in the past month because they need to have something on their airwaves and that can be done in this environment uh, at a reasonable price. Um, not so much um, drama. I think they're, they're, especially in the English speaking world, we're sort of gingerly reapproaching that. And I think um, it's gonna be fits and starts for a while on that end. We were very fortunate because we were shooting Leonardo, which is an English language production in Italy. And we had to stop in March uh, and we were very fortunate that we were able to resume in June and we're finishing now. Um, and it's ironic because Italy obviously was one of the first and hardest hit, but they've also been among the first to come back. And there's been very, very little incidence of um, COVID in Rome where we're shooting. Going forward, I don't think there's a, a one size fits all answer for what productions will be greenlit. I think there are certain geographic areas where actually it's quite realistic and safe to resume shooting now. Like for instance, shooting in, in uh, Rome has been very safe and, um, and, and easy, really pretty straightforward. And, and the testing uh, requirements haven't really slowed us down very much or been too uh, onerous. And there are other parts of, of Europe, I'm aware the production has resumed and is, is going forward as normal. I think in areas where COVID um, has never really been tamed, um, it's going to be, uh, we're going to be much more cautious about coming back. Um, I think there are certain kinds of shows, though, that lend themselves to um, shooting in this environment, smaller scale shows, more intimate shows. You know, it's going to be harder to do big shows that have lots of extras and crowds and so on for obvious reasons. Um, so I, I think we will. Uh, be back in business. Um, but, you know, I, like so many people uh, who do what I do, um, are, I'm focusing on development right now and I'm getting ready for when it's practical to go back. The role of television during this period is such an interesting question. I thought before the pandemic began, and I continue to think this is the best time in the history of television. There's more good and interesting work being done now than ever before. There's more work being done now, period, than ever before. But so much of it is, is good. I've always believed that you should try to make television that is nutritious. That is to say, it, it's saying something. It's making you think. It's challenging you. It's television that you will reflect upon and remember. That's not what most television is, but an awful lot of it does fall under that category. And I think, yes, people have rushed to uh, their screens during this pandemic and the lockdown. And it's been, you know, our, uh, our, our fireplace for all of us. We've all gathered around this. And um, to a remarkable degree, I think television has served people really well during this period. I think the most interesting thing is the acceleration of cultural unity, by which I mean uh, on platforms like Netflix in particular, you can watch shows 
from Germany, Turkey, uh, you know, Korea, Africa, all over the world in local languages. And I think there is a cross pollination of cultures that is happening right now that is unprecedented. And um, I think that's going to be another uh, change that we're going to see reverberations of, you know, for decades to come. And um, I can't help but think that's a good thing. The business landscape for television is unrecognizable today versus 10 years ago, five years ago. And that is because of the streamers. And these are vertically integrated companies, right? They, they acquire your show or produce your show with you, and then they, they distribute it themselves on their own platform all over the world. So there are no back ends to speak of. And of course, for independent producers, the back end has been the holy grail, has been uh, what you count on. And, and, and if, it's, if it's a show that is solely acquired by a streamer, then you're not going to see that. So it changes the business model quite profoundly. On the other hand, they have a massive appetite and you get to make a lot of stuff. And I think I, like most people who do what I do, your primary reason for doing this is you want to tell stories. Um, it's nice to make money. I mean, you, and you need to make a certain amount of money to, to keep the doors open and to keep hiring people. But, but mostly, um, I'm very excited by the opportunity to tell more stories, more kinds of stories, and to reach uh, a bigger audience. And, and honestly, my biggest frustration now is how do I get noticed? How do I stand out in this absolute, you know, it's a fire hose spray of programming coming at people every day and, and to, to rise to the, to the top of people's watch list and, and to be noticed is increasingly um, difficult. But um, no, I'm really uh, excited and uh, optimistic about um, about the television business right now. I don't really know the secret to standing out in this market. Um, I wish I did. I think my approach is to try and do something that nobody else is doing. You know, don't follow the crowd. Do something that is unique, uh, and do things that you're really passionate about, and that. Um, will make people think that will entertain them, but also give them something to think about. And then you hope, you know, somehow um, you're going to hit a, a, a chord, strike a chord with your audience because of that combination of things, but you never know. Um, you know, to some degree that there's, there's, there's a mystery about this that nobody quite understands. There's some shows that have been massively promoted that somehow just don't, you know, resonate with the audience and other shows that, are unfurled with no fanfare and end up being, you know, huge because of word of mouth. So it's a, it's, it's a mystery. Not surprisingly, the biggest anxiety I'm hearing right now is when can we return to production, <laughs> right? Um, I am less worried about that. I know we will return to production sooner or later. Um, the bigger concern to me is the hidden economic devastation uh, from this pandemic that we're going to see the effects of for years and years to come. And I, you know, it's like a slow moving car crash. Um, and so many of us are isolated and focused on our own little corner of the zoom universe that we're not fully aware of just how bad this has been for so many, um, businesses and the ripple effects of these, uh, this economic destruction. So we'll, we'll be seeing the effects of that for many years to come. I do think um, the Black Lives Matter movement, um, the voices calling for uh, better integration of, of people of color, that's real and, and you know, long, long overdue. I mean, I've been in this business for 25 years and I've, I've seen this paid lip service to forever and nothing ever seemed to change. And I really do feel even before the pandemic, in terms of hiring women and women directors, there was real change in the last couple of years. And I do think you're going to start to see real change in terms of um, more people of color and minority voices uh, being heard. And, you know, it, that, that's a huge problem that is really needs to be addressed. And I mean, I still think it's a, it's a problem as we're speaking right now. I see it. Um, but I think it's going to get better. I'm, I'm really optimistic. It's going to get better. 
we are wrapping Leonardo, um, and and so that'll be the next one out of the gate, um, which I'm really excited about with Aiden Turner and Freddie Highmore. Um, I have two other uh, series that are greenlit, but I, I can't announce them yet. So Big Light's very busy. Um, and then I've got some more shows that, that are mine that are hopefully um, going to be greenlit uh, in the next little while. So as I said, I, I think it's a great time to be in television and I'm really, uh, really optimistic. I can't remember who, whose slogan this is. Maybe it's the Biden campaign slogan, rebuild better. Um, I think, you know, having a pause is an opportunity to stop and reflect on the way you do things instead of just doing them the way they've always been done. And I think there's many things about um, film production um, that could be done differently and more efficiently. And uh, I hope that will happen. I hope we'll look at our practices, how many people are on set, the hours that people work, how many people really need to go in in person. I, I think for so many reasons, um, that's a really good thing to look at. Um, the hours that you shoot in Europe tend to be shorter, but in America, they're very dangerous, those long hours that people work. And I know that that's one thing that's being looked at, which I think will be um, really positive. And then I think um, the number of, of meetings we have in person and virtually, that, that's also something that's gonna change. How much travel we do is going to change. But these are all sort of you know practical matters, process questions. I think the bigger change that, again, it's too early for us to really understand is going to be the cultural, social, and economic effects of this. And um, these are things we're going to um, come to understand, Not we're not going to be fully in control of. And But I do think those of us who are listening and aware are going to be better positioned to um, to embrace the change and make it, make sure it's positive change because it, it, it isn't necessarily going to be positive, some of it. Um, you know, th there's progressive forces out there that are very loud. And whenever that happens, there's also going to be reactionary forces who are going to push back. And, and, you know, history tells us those forces can be very powerful. Um, you know, I did the show called Man in the High Castle. And one of my motivations for doing that show was don't assume the good guys will win. You know, there's no guarantee and if we want the good guys to win, you know, we've got to be that change. <laughs> we've got to fight that battle. So I hope those of us who are storytellers and are in the drama community will, um, will be aware that these, these fights are going to be happening and that we are on the side of uh, inclusion and tolerance and understanding. <laughs>